Christian church leadership. Why does it happen and what can we do about it? Let's talk with Michael Kruger on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, we always have a place at our table for you. And you say, I wish you'd quit saying that. Well, I say it because I mean it. And you're going to have to deal with it or go find a place at somebody else's table. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. And Matthew Border, our executive producer, is here. This show is airing in late January, but believe it or not, we're recording it before Christmas. Matthew, you got any Super Bowl predictions you'd like to make? I'm not an expert, but yeah, why not? I'll throw it out there and it could work and that would be awesome. I'll say Bills versus Eagles with Bills by three. (laughs) (laughs) And if that lands, that's going to be amazing. So is that the only one? (laughs) That's it. Listen, if you hit it next year, we'll uh, lay some money on these. All right. (laughs) If you don't, we'll know better. And our producer, Jinx, is in his little glass booth. Jinx helps me sound good. So let's be honest. uh, God did most of the heavy lifting on that one. (laughs) My voice is better than yours. uh, But I'm a lot more ugly than you are and God thought that was funny to put this wonderful voice in this body and I've never forgiven him for it. (laughs) Our video director and one man IT department, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. If John can't fix it, it just isn't broke. And George Bingham, (laughs) Dr. George Bingham, the president of Key Life, Uh, is here. Some say these intros are only good for cheap laughs, but George (laughs) says that's the only ones we can afford. (laughs) And Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy's from Connecticut, also known as the nutmeg state. Kathy, does that make you a spice girl? (laughs) Oh, Matthew. (laughs) (laughs) no but this is the time of year when one who does a lot of baking uses a lot of nutmeg so just throw that each time you think of your hometown and i do with great fondness yeah every time i open up that nutmeg and make something i think of connecticut hey guys we've got a great guest and a kind of dark subject uh dr michael kruger serves as president and Samuel C. Patterson, professor of New Testament and early Christianity at Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. He is also a leading scholar on the origins and development of the New Testament canon. Mike has a new book out, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, and it's titled Bully Pulpit, Confronting the Problem of Spiritual Abuse in the Church. Mike, uh, it's got to, you know, I don't like getting out of my comfort zone. I like to write about things I know about, and I suspect you do too. But you went way away from your New Testament scholarship. Well, uh, you do um, quote the New Testament. I would expect that from you. But this subject is different. What happened? Yeah, sometimes I wake up in mornings now and wonder the same thing. Yeah, (laughs) this is definitely outside my normal area of expertise. I mean, most people, if they know my writings, know that I like to write in the area of New Testament, early Christianity, and just a kind of -of run-of-the-mill biblical scholar. But uh, this is one of those subjects that came to my mind and my attention because I'm not just a biblical scholar, but also a seminary president. And I think a lot about leadership and we work hard on producing good leaders. And I think anyone paying attention over the last five or 10 years is recognizing that there's something going on 
in the uh, evangelical church in the Western world. And I became more and more concerned as time went on. And uh, even before this became sort of a hot topic publicly, I was already working on it and thinking about it and felt like it was time to to write a book about it. And so it's it's the first book I've ever written that I really didn't want to write. <laughs> I can say that most of my other books I actually wanted to write them, but uh, I didn't want to write this one, but felt compelled to do it for the for the good of the church. That's uh, And by the way, in a funny sort of way, it's a gift that you have made to the church. We have over 4,000 pastors on our mailing list. And uh, so I, in my involvement is not so much in uh, preparing leaders as it is to talking to those who are always there and to uh, people in the church who've been hurt who've been abused, who've been, well, we're going to talk about it. And uh, you would think that the church would be a safe place, but it's not always, is it? No, and this is what makes the subject so difficult to 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 not only write about, but also to research. I've been, in, in the course of writing this book, I've been able to sit across the table from a lot of people who've been through this and not only read their testimonies, but see them face to face and hear uh, the pain in their voice, and it's really hard to to listen to. Um, and this this is why I decided I had to write the book because I love the church. This is and this is an example of of us trying to make the church more like Jesus, uh, which I think we all would want to see. Um, so yeah, it's one of those painful subjects that that's sort of difficult, but I think in, in this case necessary. It leans kind of new meaning to the Augustine quote. Uh, the uh, Augustinians say that he never said it, but he said a lot like it, that the church was a prostitute, but she was his mother. And uh, this book is an illustration. Hey, listen, before we go any further, you know, my fear is, I believe in strong leadership, by the way. I don't believe... I. I think it was Goethe who said that when are men the most useless when the leaders won't lead and the followers won't follow. And I believe that a leader is supposed to lead. And we have to be careful that we don't read, for instance, about the Apostle Paul, who certainly wasn't a weenie and was clear in what he said and spoke forcefully. Um, also, in some imagine incredible humble ways too, um, uh, I, and I don't, you know, I don't want, I don't want leaders to be weenies and to make everything that happens in the church the result of a vote of a committee. I, I mean, there's that's not what you're talking about. So why don't you define this thing for us, and then we'll talk some about it. Yeah, so obviously we're into this very complicated topic of spiritual abuse. Uh, the subtitle of the book is Confronting uh, the Problem of Spiritual Abuse in the Church. And I spent a lot of time in my book defining the term uh, because it's controversial, complicated, and confusing to people. And we don't want to create a situation where people are lobbing the term around indiscriminately uh, as if you know anything they don't like is suddenly uh, getting the title of spiritual abuse. Uh, but it is a real problem, and I think it's a problem that we can see in the Bible. The, the way I define it in brief is spiritual abuse is when a, a spiritual leader, typically a pastor, uh, but it could be another type of spiritual leader, wields their spiritual authority in a way that is heavy-handed, harsh, domineering, and authoritarian to those under their care. Um, and as soon as you hear that definition, you realize, well, wait a second, isn't the Bible filled with leaders who kind of did exactly that? And isn't it true that Jesus and even the Apostle Peter and other places warned us about people who lord it over and domineer others. And the answer is, is yes. Yeah. So we want to recover, and this is the goal of the book, the kind of leaders that Jesus is is asking us to be. And I don't think that necessarily squares with the kind of leaders that a lot of churches are looking for. <laughs> and I think we have to reckon with that disconnect, why it's there, and how we can get it back on track. You mean churches are looking for to hire um, as a part of the job description an abusive leader? They're not looking to hire abusive leaders, of course, but they are looking for a certain profile of leader that sometimes left unchecked and left unaccountable can lead towards really problematic leadership styles. Mm -hmm. The analogy I give in is, is like Israel wanting a king like all the other nations have. 
So they clamor for a king and God says, well, you know, you want a king? And they're like, yeah, I like those people have that can go out and beat up our enemies. Um, and God basically says, oh, OK, if you get a king like that, he's not going to just beat up your enemies. He's going to effectively beat you up. Um, he's going to rule you harshly. And Israel didn't want to hear it. And I think there's a sense in which we as a church sometimes are inclined to hire the kind of leaders that are maybe the the, the least tight kind of leader that we need. Um, and they end up sometimes ruling us harshly. So no, it's not an intentional decision to hire an abusive leader. It's to liar, hire a leader they think is a superstar, uh, someone who's a franchise player who can, quote, get things done. And they don't realize sometimes if they're not careful, that can backfire on you. Well, that's so true. Huh. And it's a, it is a matter of ego. My late uh, mentor, Fred Smith, my friend and uh, mentor for 35 years, the wisest man I've ever known, made a lot of money consulting with major business and he never finished high school. And I said to him, Fred, how do you do that, man? You're not trained for that sort of thing. He said, Steve, I look for the ego. When I find the ego, I have found the problem. Probably a similarity in the church. We're talking uh, with Mike Kruger in his book, Bully Pulpit, confronting the problem of spiritual abuse in the church. You ought to get this. It ought to be studied in small groups in the church. So we're going to return like Jesus. Don't go anyplace. Thanks for joining us on Steve Brown, et cetera. We're uh, talking to seminary president and Bible scholar, Dr. Michael Kruger. Mike's new book is called Bully Pulpit, Confronting the Problem of Spiritual Abuse in the Church. And it's about time. Uh, this is not a book that says that everybody in the church is a snowflake and anytime they're offended, they've been abused. That happens a lot. We have a Sunday school class for the offended in the church that I serve, and we put them way away from everybody else. But this is a great book, and it would be a wonderful book to study in small groups in the church. And when you do, don't let the pastor come to that small group because he'll mess it up. Awesome. Mike, this is uh, sadly such a relevant topic. And uh, my only experience with this thing of, of heavy handed leaders was many, many, many years ago in a Christian organization and the head guy just kind of lorded his power around and we crossed paths and he would like physically, he's a big guy, would lean over, get right into your space, wow. make his point. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing that baffled me was not his behavior because there's always some kind of gravitational pull for all of us to be uh, selfish or ugly or whatever. The thing that baffled me was when I talked to other people about it and they're like, well, that's Jim. And I'm like, oh, wow. really? <laughs> really so i see how this ecosystem works now and i was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that phenomenon i mean could abuser even exist in a system without these enabling kind of people and and how does that happen and how do you short circuit that thing no it's a great observation i mean one of the things i try to say in the book is that when you when you start talking about how we got here and who's responsible for these types of things. Obviously, the, the individual who's an abusive leader is responsible for their actions, and no one doubts that. That's a key part of it. But the other part is the thing you're getting at. Wait a second. You don't get abusive leaders in isolation. You get them because you have a system around them that, that tolerates it, allows it, and maybe even uh, defends it when it comes up. And this is one of the things that I've noticed that's perhaps equally as discouraging as the abusive leaders themselves, is you have a system that's sort of entrenched so that they just kind of say, I don't know what to do with this. 
I guess this is what you know strong leaders do. They ruffle people's feathers. That's just Pastor Bob, and you know how he is. And there's a there's this tendency to dismiss and minimize every time uh, it comes up. Part of that, I think, is a is a is a deference to spiritual authority, which on one level is a good thing. We we mm. spiritual authority is a real thing, and we want to respect our leaders. But another level, I think people don't have the tools or the categories to know what they're even seeing. I don't think they even know what they're even experiencing. One of the things I've noticed as I wrote this book, even in the last month, I've just been inundated with emails, basically, where people are writing me their whole stories. They just send me an email with their entire story saying, what you described in the book is exactly what happened to me. And I didn't even know what to call it. I didn't even know what was going on. And then when I read your book, I realized I finally had categories. So that's part of the reason I've written the book is to help people know exactly what you experienced. What just happened to me right there? And and how do we uh, assess it? Mm-hmm. Um, Micah, um, I'm, has it been different before? I mean, are we in a sort of a different time in terms of this kind of issue? How did we, like, how did we get where we are now? You know, and what what sense do you have of how things were in the past? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I get asked all the time, is this a, is is this a new phenomenon or is it just a new awareness mm-hmm. of a phenomenon that's always been there? And I think there's probably a bit of both. Uh, one of the things I make uh, clear in the book is that uh, abusive leadership is as old as time. I mean, as soon as yeah. there's humans that are in the fall and and have sinful hearts, they're going to, you know, lord it over another human being in a way that's demeaning and cruel. And that's not new. In fact, I have a whole chapter in my book covering, you know, spiritual abuse through the ages of Israel and the church. So on one level, we could say, hey, there's nothing new here. But on another level, I think we can also say that certain cultural moments may feed this in ways that that, that other cultural moments don't. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about what that, what what are the causes of it in our moment, if we are in fact seeing an increase. Um, and I do think that there's something to be said for the state of the church in the Western world right now, feeling very much under attack, feeling very much disrespected, feeling very much like they they're, they're not, they, they, its own authority and role is not acknowledged. And I think pastors feel like their own authority and role is not acknowledged because it's not seen as respectful or or uh, worthy of people's attention. And sometimes there's a defensive mechanism there where we feel the obligation to prove prove our authority. And I think one of the things that that, that factors into this is that once you get into a mode where you're trying to prove your authority, that that can lead to really really uh, uh, bad places. Hmm. You know, referring to what my mentor said about looking for the ego, we also, um, we have a a subculture that, that uh, praises and lifts up and worships at the altar of ego centered leaders. Television has had something to do with that. The media has had something to do with it. Uh, and that's kind of dangerous too, isn't it? It is. Uh, one of the things I, I tell my students all the time is, as much as criticism is painful when you get it in a, in a church leadership position, it's not always the thing that's the most harmful for you. Sometimes the thing that's most harmful for you is the praise. People mm-hmm. incessantly praising you and if and borderline even worshiping you as a leader. And I think our current situation in our culture today in the church is one in which we have a tendency to want to think in leadership terms like the world. And if you want to make something successful in the world, you find yourself a franchise player. And then you build the entire team around the franchise player, right? Sort of LeBron James. You get your superstar and everything funnels through the superstar. And we think church works that way. If I want to have a big successful church, I find my superstar and I funnel through there. And so there is a sense in which this kind of leader is not just the result of some individual wanting to be great. It's also the result of a church culture wanting to make people great and build up a leader to be their LeBron James and their superstar. And um, that becomes really problematic on so many levels, particularly when that leader goes and starts behaving in ways that are unbiblical. How do you hold that kind of leader accountable? The other the other problem with it, too, is I think it flies in the face of what Jesus and the apostles said about leadership every time they got a chance to say it, which was leadership is more about servanthood than it is about uh, glory and, and, and position. Well, the the uh, chapter in John where Jesus washes their feet oh, yeah. is an interesting chapter. He says, you know, you call me your teacher and your Lord, and you're right. That's the authority and the leadership. But I have just washed your feet. 
And uh, you should do that for one another. We don't do enough foot washing, as it were, in the church, you think? <laughs> Guys, we got to back out. I just heard the music, and it wakes me up on occasion. And <laughs> says, move it, and move it quickly. Uh, we're so glad you're with us. It is a high and holy compliment that you spend an hour of a busy day with us. The name of the book we're discussing is Bully Pulpit, Confronting the Problem of Spiritual Abuse in the Church. And there's a lot more of this. And even if you don't like it, uh, don't you touch the dial. If you do, you'll get the hives. And don't go anyplace. We're coming back. Kruger. And by the way, you can keep up with him at Michael Kruger, Michael Normal, uh, J Kruger.com, K R U G E R.com, and on Twitter at Michael J Kruger. Mike, uh, off the air and sort of as a follow up to some of the discussion we were having in the previous segment, uh, we started um, talking a little about. You know, one of the factors perhaps that's changed some or evolved in our society is that uh, we we become increasingly litigious uh, that, you know, it's so easy to sue people. Uh, you drive by the billboard and get the 800 number for the ambulance chasing law firm and decide how you want to sue somebody. Um, in how, what factor does that play in these kind of scenarios where, you know, there might be some abuse, some suspected abuse of various, uh, various kinds, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, uh, you know, the church leadership becomes sort of protective and reluctant to say, admit the problem and try and deal with it because the follow-up might be they end up with a lawsuit. That and, you know, kind of related factors, how significant is that in the in the um, thing we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a tale as old, old as time, if you could say it that way. I mean, mm -hmm. what happens when people sin? They try to cover it up. Mm -hmm. What happens when institutions sin? Well, they sometimes try to cover it up. Um, and we have a long history and track record of examples of this where when faced with an abusive leader, maybe it's sexual abuse, maybe in the case we're talking about here, spiritual abuse, rather than transparency and repentance and acknowledgement and then care for the victims, there's a circling of the wagons mentality among some churches where they think, I, you know, we're going to go bankrupt, we're going to get sued, we're going to get, you know, taken to court. Um, that That is basically saying we're going to run the church like the world runs a company. And we're going to hire lawyers that give us the best legal advice for self-protection. But that's not the, I don't think that's the way of scripture. I don't think it's the way of the gospel. The way of the gospel is owning the sin that's been committed, looking out to protect the sheep that God's called us to protect, and being honest and transparent about what took place. And if you get sued, then you get sued. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that churches, I, the idea that you're protecting Christ and the bride of Christ by doing that, I think they're actually doing the opposite. And I think this has come out in the in the, in the recent SBC reports. Those had to do more with sexual abuse, not spiritual abuse, which is our topic. But it was very clear that there was many, many times people knew about sexual abuse and didn't do anything for fear that they would get sued. And I think you've got to make sure that it's not lawyers making your decisions for you, uh, but people who are godly and care about the sheep. Good mm -hmm. stuff. Kathy? Uh, Michael, and certain um, certain church denominations, um, there are... Uh, elders or or whatever you know whatever the denomination however they refer to that particular governing body who are 
they rule, um, they have a, a different position, a role that they play in the church, different than than the past senior pastor or pastors or whatever. But they all are in a position of leadership. And when I, I was at one point in a scenario where I felt like there was not just an issue of a level of abuse that came from the pastoral leadership, but it came also from the the leadership as a whole. And it was when uh, in the earlier question that Matthew asked about those that enable, how do you, how do we, we may have to get to this more on the other side of the break, but how do we deal with scenario where it's almost like one is protecting the other? Um, and I can remember one time being told by a person in leadership who was not the senior pastor, well, this is the way, this is the way we run things here. Um, we, uh, we play things, uh, we have to play things very close to the vest is one of the terms that was, was used. And I understand that. I mean, I worked in a church for a lot of years, so I get that the congregation as a whole doesn't have to necessarily know everything that there is to know. but when you see what you feel like is people who are in fact being abused um and you have this this bubble kind of thing if that's the right terminology to use where everybody's everybody protects each other it's like where do you where do you go from there you know where where is the next place that that you can go i, I mean i don't i don't know that that there is anything because it seems like you know, each one is protecting the other. Well, yeah, you put your finger right on one of the major structural problems in all of this is how to hold a leader accountable when the people around him uh, uh, sort of, as you put it, put this whole thing in a bubble, keep it top secret, don't share it, not transparent. And one of the lessons I think we've learned in abuse cases is that, you know, organizations aren't very good at investigating themselves. Um, they, they typically are going to go into protection mode. And so one of the things I advocate in the book is you need a third party outside investigator who can be an independent uh, look at these matters. Mm -hmm. Some denominations have a structure, a methodology for doing that. But that can be a problem too. I mean, they can become a part of that protective mechanism. And you gotta make sure that you, when you choose somebody outside, it's somebody who uh, um, has a lot of integrity and a lot of courage. Guys, uh, this book is called Bully Pulpit, Confronting the Problem of Spiritual Abuse in the Church. It's a problem. Don't go away. that you can send us a prayer request directly through our Key Life app. Not only that, it puts all of our radio shows, podcasts, videos, articles, and there are a pile of them right on your phone. You ought to go to that app. Our IT guy, uh, John Myers, worked literally months on that app, and, uh, and it is incredible. So give it a try at keylife.org slash app. Mike, <laughs> how do we fix it? <laughs> yeah, that's that's we the challenging have, part. I expect it? you to resolve all of these problems. <laughs> within the next I think one show should take care of it, don't you? <laughs> just <laughs> just replay this, and all the problems are solved. <laughs> uh, yeah, and even in the introduction to my book, I said very plainly that. You know, I'm going to offer some some suggestions and some places that we can hopefully make some progress. But that, but even if someone did every single thing I recommend in my book, which I think are very basic things, we still have a long way to go because it's one thing to change process and structure. It's another thing to change culture and to change hearts and change ethos. And I think there's some more deep 
issues there in Western modern evangelicalism that you, you can't just solve by having a committee in one spot mm. as opposed to something else. And so, you know, my book can't deal with all that. I do try to address some of the hard issues at the end and what what makes a leader behave like this. Um, but but I do think some structural improvements can really matter. Uh, I'll mention one as we get going on this, something that I think we just don't give near enough attention to, and that is vetting the character of potential leaders at the front end. You know, it's one thing to stop abuse after someone's already in power when you recognize it and you try to put a stop to it and hold someone accountable. But what if we worked harder at the front end of the ministerial process by helping vet people's character in a way that that really does assess these tendencies before they actually get into office? Sort of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure kind of idea. And I think when I look at the landscape of the way we train ministers, and I'm in a seminary, so I, I see this, and the way denominations assess ministers, I would say that it's 90% assessing doctrine and probably 10% mm. assessing character. Uh, and I really think, biblically speaking, the, the qualifications for a minister, obviously doctrine matters very much, but character matters very much. And I point out in the book how often character comes up. So we probably need to really rethink that in the way we assess candidates. Uh, how, how much are we doing a deep dive into this person, their character, their tendencies, their proclivities uh, to try to deal with this before it even gets out of the gate? I have a situation with which I was involved and uh, a very abusive pastor who was very articulate. Uh, but some of the leadership had discovered this happened in two other churches mm. where the devastation was just awful. And uh, I said to some of the leaders, what in the world were you thinking? Didn't you even check? And they said, <laughs> no, we really didn't. We checked on wow. theology. But we didn't check on this other stuff. And if we had, we never would have called him. So what you say is really important. Hmm. Matthew? Mike, you go into some specific incidents in the book of, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of case studies of this is what happened. And, and I'm hesitant to even ask this question, but because I, I'm, I'm I, suspect the answer might be to the negative but have you in your research come across any situations where the problem was identified and handled in a healthy way and it and and the course shifted or is it almost invariably where people make a series of bad decisions and then it's just a matter of the rest of the dominoes falling and then cleaning up the mess is have, have you come across any incident where there was an intervention and, and things went to a positive, restorative kind of direction. Oh, man, that's a very interesting question. I, I don't know that I had that many cases where I've seen that. Yeah. But you, could, you, could argue, <laughs> you could argue that maybe those don't make the headlines because there was a, res, a positive response and a restoration. But here's the thing I, I, I've learned in my, my research is that the type of personalities that abuse are, are often the very type of personalities that are very slow to repent and acknowledge wrongdoing. And so the amount of real repentance in a, in a spiritual abuse cases is is shockingly low. Um, and what you end up realizing is that once an abusive leader is, is in position of power and abusing, uh, in some sense, you always pray for repentance. But our best hope often is just that there's a structure in place that can stop it, acknowledge it, and bring healing to the people who've been hurt. So I can say I've seen success stories in my research where there was an abusive leader who was noted for abuse, called out, stopped, and, and in one sense, removed from office. And I would say that's a win. Yeah. But it's also a loss, depending on how you look at it, because the guy never repented, and those you still have a trail of, of uh, broken lives behind you. So depends how you made your success, right? But I think you're right. There's not a lot of success stories in terms of someone going, oh, thanks for pointing that out. I think I'll stop uh, and re recognize I got a long way to go here. And I, that, that just doesn't happen very much. But but I think that does speak to the importance of the structure. It's like there's a fire in a building and, you know, yeah, damage was done, but the, the system kicked in and it suppressed yes, it. And, it's exactly and I'm right. like, it's it's tragic. But in, in, in the situations, just like you said, it could have been much worse and the system kind of worked as best as it could. Right. So my my solution is you got to hit this from both sides. There's the preventive side. You don't want fires mm -hmm. to ever start. But then mm -hmm. there's what do you do when fires start? How do you put it out quickly so the damage is minimized? And I think we've got to look at both. My, my point in the book is I think we've mainly looked at how to deal with the damage after the fire started, whereas I also want to look at preemptive, how to keep uh, people from getting into these positions in the first place. But both really do matter. Yeah. Well, it almost makes it seem like it's that seems like it would suggest that 
kind of the source of the problem is not so much knowledge. I mean, it's not that people just, you can just tell them don't do that or don't do it that way or whatever. And they'll say, oh, okay, yeah, I won't do that anymore. It is more the kind of the character issue. And so there may not be another place for this person aspiring to leadership. They just may need to do something else. Yeah, I think I think a lot of churches feel like they don't have a choice. Like, well, he's a really gifted guy. If we if we cut him loose, then our church is going to shrink or whatever. And I'm like, mm. okay, but but this is not a qualified person for the ministry, yeah. and they're harming God's sheep. So you've got to act, even if your church shrinks. As a result, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, listen. If somebody has a lust for power and a Machiavellian sense of ethos, you're clearly called to politics. Step. Back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the overlap funny. between politics and ministry these days is rather <laughs> scary. So, yeah, that's probably part of the problem too. So, <laughs> and you have to you have to be careful too, because uh, about ten percent of the church are uh, very upset with the pastor at any given time. And I've told, if you don't have 10%, you're not doing what Jesus told you to do. <laughs> if it's over the True. that, it's, you've got a real problem. So mm. this is a, a minefield, and you've got to be careful. But you can't just sit and watch people being blown up. Mike, you're a gift of the church. Thank and you, you were Very a kind. gift to us today. Thank you. And I know how busy a, a seminary president is. Thank you for taking your time to be with us. Great Hope to be with you. we can do this again sometime. Hope so. Hey, guys, we're going to come back and tell you who we're going to do it unto next week. But this hour is an important one. Bully pulpit confronting the problem of spiritual abuse in the church by Dr. Michael Kruger. Get it, read it, underline it, apply it. But you be careful out there. Don't go anywhere. We are coming back for a brief moment. discussion than we gave it. You ought to get the book and read it. One of the men who had an amazing impact in my life was Ben Hayden. And he adds a great attraction to heaven. He was a very strong leader. Uh, nobody, uh, uh, people, well, he was a very strong leader. And the first time I spoke at First Presbyterian in Chattanooga, which was Ben's church, and I always did this. I asked the guy who picked me up at the airport. I said, I always ask about the pastor. If they say the pastor is awful or he needs a little bit of work or we're trying to work out some problems. I know there's some serious problems in the church. If they say our pastor is absolutely wonderful, then I know it's going to be fairly smooth sailing while I'm there. So I asked this guy, I said, what do you think about Ben? He said, I hate him. I said, you what? He said, I hate him. I don't like the way he wears that dumb toupee. I don't like the way he talks. I don't like his leadership style. But I'll tell you something, Dr. Brown. When my mother was dying, he didn't leave her bed for 48 hours until the moment she died. And I will follow Ben Hayden through a wall to the pit of hell. <laughs> and I thought, you know, Ben is, was an extreme on both sides. He was a strong leader, but he was a foot washer. And uh, anybody who's ever been hurt or broken with a broken heart, Ben was there. And those people followed him for the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. So you got to be careful. We don't want to get rid of strong leaders. We just want to get rid of mean leaders and be able to deal with that kind of thing. Great 
great hour. Mm. I like Mike Kruger and like what he writes and his balance. This will be a good book to study in your church. Catherine, who's going to be on next week? Excuse me, Laura Childers. Um, her book is titled Lives Transformed. And uh, Matthew, actually sitting right there with a copy of it. Tell us, give us a, like a little. Well, here it is. Lovely water, water uh, colors on the cover. And it says Lives Transformed is a collection of stories gathered in the 150 years since Jerry and Maria McCauley founded their groundbreaking mission on Water Street in 1872. Oh, man. It's going to be a fun. This is going to be an upper. It's different. We're it's going different. to like this. Yeah. And it'll be a nice break, frankly. <laughs> I'm tired of talking about death and darkness and brokenness and bad leaders and sexual abuse and all that. So we got a gift for you next week. You join us. Same time, same place. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth.